Louis wasn't necessarily like a biker guy, but he kind of he kind of uh, lived that lifestyle. He li he lived an aggressive lifestyle. And me and my brother, we were like, what is this method that he's always talking about? That you got a speed day, and then you have a heavy day, and the heavy day seems kind of cool because you get to pick different exercises. So I was all in on that. I was like, this sounds amazing. He would spend a lot of time with everybody. It didn't matter who it was. Yeah. Because I'm, yeah, when some of these like fights broke out or whatever, like how would Louie handle it? Like, would he uh, try to like get in between people? Uh, he, he <laughs> thought it was great. I would assume, I don't know, but it seems like with all the different things that Louis was doing and with conjugate, all the different types of movements he was adding in, it seemed like he had that same type of white belt mentality. In his own words, he would say like, oh, I was shitty. I was just shitty lifter. So uh, I needed to learn everything that I possibly could. A lot of things were really dangerous. <laughs> you know, he, and he would always say like the most dangerous exercises are the best. And I was like, yeah, maybe to a certain degree, but like, you know, how, dang <laughs> how dangerous this shit have to get, you know? <laughs> By the way, people don't know this about Louis Simmons, but this is important. Louis Simmons is a fucking savage and he's a gangsta. He, he is fucking loaded. He is an entrepreneur to the fucking max. He got dough. And uh, in the gym too, like he would set stuff up and it sometimes takes forever, you know, with certain setups that we do in the gym. Mm. And he'd be like, now this is totally set up for tomorrow. Can't wait to deadlift tomorrow. He's like, let's get out of here, Smelly. I would spend, you know, a few minutes like clearing the weight off, putting the bands away. And then he'd come in the next morning. He's like, God damn it. It's like, this happens every week. <laughs> Everything that he did gets amplified and you're like, whoa, the impact is like, uh, you know, too large to even almost like figure out. He impacted so many, uh, so many great people in so many different ways. You know, I don't know what's going to happen or, or come of West Side Barbell, uh, but Louis has kind of stated, I think he says it in the movie, um, West Side versus the world that the gym dies with him. All right. Well, today we're going to dive in and we're going to talk about my mentor, Louis Simmons. Um, I saw a lot of posts. I saw a lot of people talking about Louis's death. Um, and I just kind of wanted to pull back a little bit from it and give it, uh, an opportunity, um, you know, give people an opportunity to kind of, to voice their opinions on, you know, uh, his, I guess the life that he led and stuff like that. But I, I wanted to take a little while to kind of organize my own thoughts on what to say. And then I was kind of like, eh, you know, I can do like an Instagram post about this and maybe I still will do a shorter version of it. But I was like, the only way to really talk about this or tackle it is to talk about it in long format. Uh, I first off want to say that when someone dies, I don't personally uh, share the same view as maybe a lot of other folks. I don't always view it as, uh, I don't necessarily attach sadness with it, especially not immediately. Um, something that might happen though, is I might think of Louis Simmons and I might think of his wife, Doris, or some of the people that he's left behind, uh, that I was friends with the people that I've, I have known for a long time. And, uh, and when I think about those kind of things, I'm like, man, that does, that does really suck. So those kind of things can make me feel some sadness, but, uh, having lost a lot of people in my lifetime, I've kind of learned, uh, over a period of time to just accept the fact that anyone who's alive right now can die. Mm. Um, sometimes it is unexpectedly, um, in the case of Louis Simmons, um, you know, L Louis wasn't necessarily like a, uh, a biker guy, but he kind of, he kind of, uh, lived that lifestyle. He, li he lived, uh, you know, different lifestyle. He, li he lived an aggressive lifestyle. So you always knew that like, you know, he could get hurt severely in the gym, uh, he could like blow something out in the gym. Um, he could have a scare at the hospital. He's been in the hospital many times for many different situations. He wasn't uh, super healthy. And so like, I always kind of recognize like, yeah, like there's one day this is going to come to an end. And I believe he was uh, 74 years old. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about some of these pictures that were posted everywhere is that I took that fucking picture. <laughs> oh, this one right here? Yeah. Wow. Uh, there's a lot of pictures that were like this that were posted and I actually took some of these. I, I don't know for sure if that one's the one, but like, I don't know if you guys remember, but like Louie was on the cover of Power Magazine um, and I, the the, mm. the cover on Power Magazine, I think those axes on his chest, those tattoos that he has, they kind of have like blotches of blood on him. Mm -hmm. But when I took a picture of him, he had a pretty bad nosebleed 
and he just had blood on him, like legitimately anyway. <laughs> he's sitting over there doing, uh, he's in a squat rack and he's doing like uh, rack pulls. Anyway, so just so people are aware, like when my own mother died, like my first reaction wasn't just to start bawling out crying. My first reaction was to get around my dad and see him. And obviously when I saw my dad, there was some waterworks. Of course, I'm going to cry because I'm thinking about, um, you know, I'm thinking about all the other people that we know that are going to be impacted by this and how hurt they will be. So that's where the hurt comes from. But in general, uh, when someone dies, all I think about is how they lived. And with Louis Simmons, you know, I can't help but think about uh, how the guy lived and all the different stuff that he's responsible for. And I'd love to share with everybody today. Uh, I, I'm not going to be able to get to all of it, I don't think, but all the different things, you know, that go well beyond just the reverse hyper and some bands and chains that uh, Louis Simmons opened up to the world. What made you, because like you went to go train at that gym, but like, for you and a bunch of people that you actually trained at that gym with, what made you go over there and actually start training there? And how old were you? Because you were young as you you were young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's the same thing as as what everybody else experienced. It was Louis Simmons himself. You know, I, I so Louis Simmons. Uh, first of all, he had a big impact on me even at a really young age because he had articles in Powerlifting USA. You got to kind of think back like this was a long time ago preceding the internet. There was a time before the internet, everybody. <laughs> and uh, Louis wrote articles for Powerlifting USA. And uh, they shaped uh, the way a lot of people lifted, uh, including myself and me and my brother. We were like, what is this method that he's always talking about? This, you got a speed day and then you have a heavy day. And the heavy day seems kind of cool because you get to pick different exercises. So I was all in on that. I was like, this sounds amazing. At the end of the article, there was a phone number. And when you mm -hmm. called the phone number, mm -hmm. you would hear a voice on the other side and pick up and say, West Side. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, hello? <laughs> and you go, this is Louie. How can I help you? Like, Louie Sim was actually pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. His number was in the fucking magazine. And so I remember like calling that number, first of all, being incredibly nervous, not being able to like put two words together because I did have questions for him about like these training methods because it, it said, if you have any questions, you know, call this number. I was like, I'd like to learn more so I can actually start to apply this and utilize this in my training. And when I called, I was not expecting to actually get Louis Simmons himself. Uh, and then he proceeded to talk to me for like a half an hour. You know, ask me where I live and all these different things. And my brother had similar experiences with Louis. So we called him over the years. Uh, but then I think I was like 20, maybe two or something like that, or 23. Mm -hmm. And I called him and I said, uh, you know, I would love to move out there and train at Westside. I had previously worked out at Westside before just on like a visit but I didn't know if there was like certain numbers that you needed to do or if there was some sort of like requirement. Uh, so I called him and I said, I want to move to Columbus. I want to train there. I want to learn from you. I want to like be there and, and absorb as much as I can. This is after several phone conversations. I'm not calling yeah. him being a crazy person. <laughs> but, uh, and I said, I, I, I would love to help you out in whatever way I can, whatever I can offer, help clean the gym or whatever. And, um, he was like, all I need is your blood, sweat, and tears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, all I need is for you to like just, he's like, you're down to like work. You're down to put in the work. And, and there was wasn't like, like a gym membership fee or anything like that. There was, was nothing. Free. There was, yeah, there's no fee. Um, there, uh, there was no like prerequisite in terms of like how much you lifted. Now he did say, <laughs> he's like, you're going to get made fun of a lot because you're not a power lifter. He's like, the only other people that we have here are power lifters. And uh, at the time, I was pursuing a career in professional wrestling. So um, I don't know what, like, I don't know what it is about Louis Simmons or what he found in me or what he saw or I don't, I still don't really know. It was interesting, though, that nobody else lifted there. There was other people that would come in and lift occasionally. Mm -hmm. And he worked with professional athletes and he worked with a lot of other people. Um, but at the time he accepted me into Westside Barbell, it was all full-on powerlifters. Now, I did have a powerlifting background from when I was a kid, 
but I stopped that for a long time. So like while I was in his gym, I didn't have a total. I didn't produce anything for West Side. I didn't. I did one uh, bench competition because one of the guys in there was talking shit, mm -hmm. and so I, I beat uh, a member there named Chicken Hawk. Everyone has a nickname mm -hmm. uh, in in a bench contest. But um, you know, so it was amazing that he even uh, kind of accepted me into the crew, and I just. I fucking moved to Columbus. I started training there. And like you said, there's no fee. There was no, there was no nothing. Just, I just needed to show up and train hard. So is that partially why you ended up, I don't know how long super training has been a free gym because it's free now, mm -hmm. but is it partially free because of what he was doing over there? Like, did you see the, the, um, the energy and the stuff that he was doing there and you wanted to replicate that? A hundred percent. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to replicate exactly what he had uh, for many, many reasons. I mean, there's only one Louis Simmons, only one West Side Barbell. So I was definitely not trying to necessarily, you know, completely mimic what he was doing. But I saw the value of having a gym that's free. And I saw the people that were that were in his gym and how much he cared about people. And here's something that people probably don't know. People talk about him being mean, like being this mean old man and all these different things. And he, he really, he really wasn't necessarily mean. Um, he'd get a little mean or nasty here and there, but he had a really hard time just flat out. Like he didn't have a hard time telling you about your lifts. He didn't have a hard time saying, Hey dude, you fucking suck at deadlifts. Like he wouldn't have a hard time with that. But he would have a hard time, you know, telling you that you like you don't fit in or like, you know, mm -hmm. he wouldn't he wouldn't be able to like kind of break the news to you on some of those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, in general, he was uh, he was really kind. But something that I think people don't know. And one of the things I admired the most about Louis, and hopefully you guys have seen me do this. This is something that I actually kind of like I try to work on because it's not. It's not always in our nature uh, to to do this, but like he would spend a lot of time with everybody. It didn't matter who it was. Yeah. It just didn't matter who it was. Didn't matter if it was a fan. It didn't matter if it was the Indianapolis uh, Colts uh, strength coach. It didn't matter if it was the Cleveland Browns strength coach. It didn't matter if it was a guy uh, who's you know coaching people to be uh, professional soccer players. Or if it was just some guy who wants to go from 135 squat to 185 pound squat, he spent a lot of time with people. And I, I recognize that as such a, just an amazing trait that I always thought that like that, that is a sign of a good man. That is a sign of a good person. He's not only rubbing elbows. He's not trying to social climb. He's not trying to climb this ladder. Uh, he's just authentic. He mm -hmm. just is the way that he is. And anybody that wanted to talk about strength, he was going to talk about strength because he talked about it from the time he woke up to the time he went to bed every day of his life. You know, I was, uh, I remember when Mark Uyayama came, and I don't know if I'm totally confused, but I remember you guys talked about going and all going somewhere to mm -hmm. learn. Was that from Louis or was that something else? Yeah, that was a super training seminar with mm -hmm. uh, Mel Siff, who wrote the book Super Training. Yeah. And that was with Louis Simmons. And I was made aware of super training and I was made aware of Mel Siff through Louis Simmons. Louis Simmons is like the uh, kind of the hub of where everyone sort of learned everything. You know, I, I can't even know. I don't even know if I'll be able to get through all the different things, but bands and chains mm -hmm. being on the bar the bands came from a guy named dick hartzell who uh was was teaching like a lot of uh stretching and things like that with with bands um he was called like the jump jump man or jump band, <laughs> jump band man or something like that mm -hmm. and uh anyway louie went to a basketball this is how like nuts louie was about about uh, powerlifting. Louis didn't care about basketball. Louis liked football. He liked MMA. He didn't really care much about basketball. But he heard about this guy that was a, that, that had these rubber bands. And Louis was like, I think if we attach, attach these things to the bar, we can cut down on deceleration is what he would kind of refer to it as. So if you can kind of picture this, if you are to bench press a barbell as fast and as furious as you possibly can, well, if you're a strong individual, you might kind of hurt yourself doing that. If you just go all out and bench it, because your body is usually smart enough, you're going to kind of slow down as you accelerate through, as you punch through. Mm -hmm. 
So you kind of can't put as much force into a dead weight like that. And so Louis's idea was, well, if I attach these bands on there, it's going to make you accelerate uh, right when we need to accelerate because we need that acceleration as you get closer to your lockout. And then it just so happens that it works out really amazingly because uh, where we're in the least advantageous position in the bottom of a squat or the bottom of a bench press, um, that's where the bands or the chains have the least amount of resistance. And then as you go through, as your body gets better leverages, as you get in a more advantageous position, there's more and more band and chain on there. So like everything that Louis did, even though it was like intuitive, it was like flat out like genius. You're like, well, the fuck, this guy's figured out some some crazy things, you know? So the bands, the chains, the box squats. Um, box squats are the thing that are like still really misunderstood. It's amazing mm -hmm. exercise. People that have banged up knees, I think they should rely mainly on a lot of box squats along with looking into ways to, you know, help their knees recover. But the sled training, the sled training came from Louis Simmons. Louis Simmons observed um, a lot of yeah. lifters from uh, Sweden, I believe. I cannot recall the guy's name, but Louis had a friend in Sweden that he communicated with a lot. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know if it's, this is like a, I don't know if it's a true story or not, but like, you know, these stories, they're fun. And uh, I guess these guys were like lumberjacks in, in Sweden and they were like, uh, you know, pulling, um, you know, wood out, out, of the, uh, out of the forest, dragging it. And they would drag it, you know, on a chain and they would walk forward, sideways, backwards with it. And he recognized all these dudes had crazy deadlifts. So he was like, let's, you know, figure out a way to get people to, you know, walk in some sort of way that mimics that. So that people would... At his gym, he would have people walking forward and backwards, and we would do like miles because we would walk around the building, and the building was like really far. Mm -hmm. And he would want you to like, I don't know, go around like three or four times. So it was like you'd walk like a mile with sled backwards with like a plate, and like he didn't even want you coming into the gym unless you were like already like <laughs> sweating. And sometimes it's fucking freezing cold, so it's like you got, you got to walk, you know. I, not everyone, a lot of people were like, fuck you, Louie. Like they, they didn't, but like, I always just tried to like, I'm like, I'm just here to learn. So I'm just going to, we called it getting Louied. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just going to get Louied every day until I can't lift anymore. And he would just absolutely kill me. He'd put me on all these contraptions and things that he has. So he also had the reverse hyper. He also had a, uh, like a plyo swing. And some of this shit was like totally dangerous. I think Corey Schlesinger mm -hmm. mentioned it when he was here or one of our other people mentioned it. It was JL, but like, you know, the first run of some of these products that he had uh, were like super dangerous. I remember yeah. actually one time at a seminar, somebody went to do a reverse hyper extension oh, no. and they didn't have like the clip on the weight. And it was a different kind of reverse hyper extension where the weight was. So normally what the weight is in front of you on this one, the weight is behind you. And it had this weird like hook thing that the weight was on and this 25 pound plate went flying up oh, in the shit. air and it landed right on the person's back. Oh. But it landed like perfectly flat and didn't hurt the person at all. Oh my gosh. I mean, that weight could have flown up in the air and hit the person's back of the head and like could have gotten nasty, right? Yeah. So yeah, a lot of a lot of Louis like inventions while they were all incredible and amazing and and still so many of them are being sold to gyms all over the world. There's the plyo swing. You can just see like holy fuck, man, that thing can get to be iffy really <laughs> quick. So he had a lot of crazy uh inventions and he would just stick me on these things. Smelly, you gotta try this. Legs. Yeah, that's Laura <laughs> Phelps. She's jacked. Jeez. Yeah, with uh, with a lot of the guys that we get to talk to, um, I'm just thinking, I don't know, like someone like Joel Seedman or even Knees Over Toes guy, they'll say something and then like I'll see your eyes kind of light up even and you'll be like, after the show, like fucking Louis Simmons has been talking about <laughs> that since forever. Did Louis ever care about like what other coaches were doing or necessarily taking from him? I mean, because I guess yeah. time-wise, you know, we guys weren't around him when yeah. Instagram I, blew up. He and would shit. be kind of pissed about stuff here and there, but like he, he just had so many ideas and so many concepts. Like you know, um, like if 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 one of us, like if he was here right now, and we asked him about that. Like he would just, 
he would all of a sudden change the subject to like, and Seema, you know what you got to do? You got to get on that box. I'm telling you, you got to, it's going to make a big difference in your training. Like he's all of a sudden just going to snap out of it and start talking. He doesn't really, he didn't really like dwell on a lot mm -hmm. of that. Although there were things like invention wise where he mm -hmm. was very like protective. He did not want people like messing with his reverse hyper mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. The things that were really truly proprietary. If it was like uh, just an idea, he wanted those ideas out and he didn't care how they got out. That's what made him special is that he spent, like I said, he spent a lot of time with a lot of different people impacting people like uh, Coach House and a lot of the other strength coaches that we've had. Mm. I was telling Nassima the other day, people from all over the world would come to this gym in Columbus, Ohio. Mm. Uh, at least when I, when I first got there, the gym was really, really small and it was next to a donut shop. <laughs> which is super appropriate because that's where everybody had their post-workout donuts. But um, the, so Louie tried to paint the window black so you couldn't see inside of it. And then it was just like, uh, it turned like purple because like the sun would mm -hmm. come in on it. Uh -huh. And the gym was disgusting. I remember like we, uh, somebody uh, went to move. We had this platform that you would deadlift with <laughs> because it, that's how you hooked up the bands. They didn't have like, th shit wasn't all set up nice the way it's set up now. It was this weird, uh, like, platform that was, like, real sketchy that, like, if you didn't set the bands up perfect on there, the bands would, like, pop off and stuff. It was just, like, everything was chaotic. Anyway, uh, someone goes to move the, uh, they go to move this little platform thing, and it falls, and it just creates this giant thing of dust. Oh, There's so much, like, God. dust and, like, soot in the air. I'm like, Jesus Christ, it looked like. You know, it looked like something after 9-11. Like, it was <laughs> it fucking erupted. No. <laughs> yeah, it, it, looked, it looked insane. And then um, I said to somebody in there, I was like, I go, man, I was like, this place is a real shithole. And, like, someone else was like, what did you say? <laughs> and I was like, this place is fucking gross. Like, I started kind of laughing about it. And then, like, I, I didn't know, like, I'm like, are these guys going to, like, kick my ass? Like, <laughs> what's going on here but now they were at, you know they kind of laugh too and they're like well make sure you tell louie when he comes in that places places a dump or whatever and then so i louie and i had a great relationship we were always like making jokes and stuff mm -hmm. i'm like lou i'm like this place is a shithole he's like you're damn right smelly <laughs> he's like i love it that's the way it's gotta be no, i really need a I, okay because i was uh i saw half of west side versus the world i'm gonna finish it mm. but man when i was watching i'm like were these men really this violent? Like you see this clip of Dave Tate and he was like, yeah, one day Louie was lifting. I was like, I hope this motherfucker hurts himself. And then he herniated his back and I was like, yeah, bitch, I got you. I was like, damn, bro, what? Like, was it really like that? Yeah, everyone got like crazy competitive <laughs> and you got to think, you know, uh, a, lot, a lot of these guys are on performance enhancing drugs and stuff too. People are getting ready for competitions and everything was about like trying to get on that board. Um, and, and so, you know, everyone's trying to get on that record board. And so like, you didn't care like you, you were hoping that the other guy at least was out for the day. You hope oh like, God. hope something happens to him. So that <laughs> way I can fucking continue, <laughs> continue onward. Even though God, that's so fucked up, even though it doesn't help you at all, <laughs> but you're like, all right, that's one less person I got to worry about. Oh, uh, man. I remember, uh, there was one occasion in there where we were doing some bench pressing and. Um, I think it was Brandon Lilly. Uh, he was like, oh man, I, I did something to my pec and um, Louie's watching us and, and uh, we're benching and we're going back and forth and it's rotation, you know, in the rotation, it's time for Brandon to go again. And Brandon's like, Lou, I don't know. I, th I just, you know, I'm not feeling it today. I think I did something to my pec. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to save it. And Louie's like, we saved nothing in this gym. <laughs> and he just like walked away and Brandon's like, do I do another set? I was like, I was like, I don't, I was like, I wouldn't. <laughs> anyway, Brandon did another set and he tweaked himself mm. like a, a little bit more. I think he was fine, but okay, good. Uh, I was like, yeah, I was like, I don't think, I think he wants you to like make sure that you're out of your own head. Yeah. But I don't think he like wants you literally to continue onward and tear your pack for no, no fucking reason. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, it was super competitive that way. And, uh, like, so if somebody got beat on, like, a box squat or something, like, even though you weren't supposed to beat each other on the box squats because uh -huh. it was usually on a dynamic day where you're trying to just move fast. You're not trying to move the most amount of weight. You know, 
it would be like quiet in there. Like if 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 somebody got beat that wasn't supposed to get beat. Yeah. It maybe it happens in jujitsu a little bit. Not where people are like mad or anything, but it was just like a little uneasy. Like like no one talked about it. Yeah. You know, like if you tapped like your instructor or something like that. It's like everyone saw it. Like we're good. And we're going to talk about it when we get out of class. <laughs> but we ain't going to talk about that shit right now. <laughs> I'll be quiet. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's like kind of walking on eggshells. Yeah. Know? How did, uh, like, when, because I'm, yeah, when some of these, like, fights broke out or whatever, like, how would Louie handle? Like, what would he just kind of be sitting in the back, like, kind of like uh, being like a commentator? <laughs> or would he uh, try to, like, get in between people? Uh, he he <laughs> thought it was great, usually, because, like, he, you know, he... <laughs> He like he kind of started it a lot of times. <laughs> he would just like talk so much shit to everybody in there. Okay. Uh, he'd walk over to me and he'd be like, "Smelly, what in the fuck are you doing?" And I was like, "I'm doing like you told me like three weeks ago to do these uh, rolling dumbbell tricep extension." He's like, "God damn it, that was three weeks ago." He's like, "You're living in the past." I'm like, "Well, well I don't know. Like, what, <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> should I be?" Fuck, yeah, this what? makes so much sense because you kill me like that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so then he would uh he would mention someone in the gym you know he would be like he would pick someone that was like in your weight class uh -huh. and um he would be like oh you know jl is doing uh you know banded deadlifts or something and and like he's using like 600 pounds of band tension he's getting really strong and you'd be like well i don't fucking care like because you're in the middle of like a workout and he's like pestering you you know and he's just peppering you with all this bullshit all the time and then, uh, you know, sure enough, because like other guys in the gym started doing it and started getting results from it, hmm. you would end up doing it. But by the time you got around and to doing it, he was like, that was like six months ago. He's like, mm. you, know, you need to keep keep moving on and, and kind of find the, uh, the most current thing. But he talked a lot of shit. One of my favorite things about him is that he used to dance all the time. <laughs> what? He would dance and he would fucking talk shit like you wouldn't believe. And it wasn't really a whole lot of dancing, but he was like, he would like move with the music, you know? Yeah. And uh, I don't know what the name of the song is from DMX, but it goes, move, bitch, get, get out, out the, the way, way. Yep. move <laughs> over and over again. And I just got done doing like a lift. I was we were doing max effort deadlifts, uh, like a um, like a rack pull. And I did pretty good for me for the day. I did like six seventy five or something. But these guys, you know, they're doing eight fifty five and just like stacking, you know, fucking crazy amounts of plates on there. Uh, and so I went for my next lift, and you know, I go to do it, and I get the weight off the rack just like an inch, and then. You know, I I can't lift it. And then so like the rotation comes around and I, I give it one more go because you were allowed to like try it one more time. Mm. And I missed it again. And that song's on. And Louie's like, move, bitch. Get out the way. Get out the way. And he's like dancing back and forth. And he's like pointing at me and like no. giving me like the thumb. Oh, just. There's a 24-hour fitness down the street. Yeah. <laughs> He was just like it, that's demoralizing. Oh, completely, de <laughs> completely demoralizing. He's like, "Smelly, you need more accessory work." I've been telling you this for six. You know, he's just like, "All right, Lou, yeah, I get it. Okay, dude, it just happened. Like, let me fucking be sad about it for at least a moment. Give me like, yeah. give me like five minutes." Oh no, he'd be right up your ass right away. Yeah, it was ludicrous. Move, bitch. Oh, oh ludicrous. ludicrous. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry, ludicrous. It's okay. Damn, you know, you know he, he watches the show. Mm -hmm. A cool thing is like um, it seemed that like in terms of the way that like where we take a lot of people in in terms of uh, like on the podcast and a lot of people come on and teach us different things. Mm -hmm. I would assume I don't know, but it seems like with all the different things that Louis was doing and with conjugate, all the different types of movements he was adding in, it seemed like he had that same type of white belt mentality. Like mm -hmm. he knew a lot. I mean, dude was reading Russian textbooks and shit. Yeah. But it seemed like he was always open to learning. And I'm curious, since you knew him well, like, was he? Like, did he seem like that? Like, how, how was he as far as trying new things with West Side stuff? Yeah, in his, own, in his own words, you know, something to this effect, he would say, like, I was, I was shitty. I was a shitty lifter. So uh, I needed to learn everything that I possibly could. You know, so he would kind of reference that about himself. And he said that he he did a little bit of Olympic lifting and that he gained a little bit of strength in Olympic lifting, but he just never really, he never really liked it. And when he switched over to powerlifting, 
he felt that like he could definitely make a lot more progress in powerlifting, but he was just like, I just need to learn a lot more. Um, and he just absorbed as much as he possibly could by getting around other lifters. Uh, I think he pretty quickly recognized that having an environment was going to be a key factor, having yeah. other people around you that, cause like, you know, if you go, I mean, nowadays it's so different cause again, the internet, but like if you went to a powerlifting meet years ago, like let's just say like 30, 40 years ago, right? There still might be a guy there that squats like 800, 800 pounds, you know, seven, 800 pounds. But the next closest guy only squats like 600 or 650. Mm. And so, you know, in order to gain that kind of strength, it's like you need to be around people that are going to recognize that those weights are even possible in the first place. And the only people that would know that are people that bend to powerlifting meets. Like I saw a guy deadlift 800 pounds and I think I was like 14 years old. Whoa. So like I knew at a young age, like how strong some people were. Um, I saw Ted RCD do 700, you know, in the bench press. And, you know, I saw like some pretty remarkable lifts at a young age. Meanwhile, someone else at that age who's just starting lifting, maybe they don't have that same perspective. Maybe they think 300 is heavy because that's what the guy at their local gym does. Mm -hmm. And so he, I think he recognized like, look, man, I better... I better learn a lot and I better get around as many people as I possibly can to continue to like share uh, these ideas and concepts. One thing that I think is like just he should be commended on is that he was open to ideas from like his own lifters. His own lifters would have ideas or concepts and they would actually kind of shape. He would set up some of the program and stuff, but like he would watch and observe and like one of the best benchers that he had was a guy named George Halbert. And he just would watch and observe the amount of work that that guy did or what that guy gravitated towards, what that guy's, where that guy's interest was, you know, what was the, what were the things that were going to be things that he could do consistently? They were going to be the things that he's interested in. Right. And so Lou would kind of observe that and he plug and play that into his program. But I think the most genius thing about the West side program, if you read if anybody wants to like learn and Louis, <laughs> he would be pissed that I'm referencing this, but the periodization Bible part one and two, it's still on eliteFTS.com. In my opinion, it's the greatest article ever written on uh, the West Side method because it explains it so thoroughly and it explains uh, periodization and all the different things that people utilize and why you might want to look into utilizing something like the conjugate system. There's also uh, Jim Wendler's 531. There's a, those are all really good options. There's his book of methods too, right? Yeah, the there's West Side Book of, Methods. West Side book of Methods, which explains everything. But Dave Tate's Periodization Bible Part 1 and 2 it, it explains why the it explains why the method is so useful and why it's so good and why like when somebody says it doesn't work I I do understand like somebody could try something and it doesn't work maybe the way they want it to mm. or something like that. I would just disagree heavily after being someone who's done it. And if you read Periodization Bible Part 1 and 2, you'll see that it's impossible for it to not work mm. because the, the, uh, the spectrum of what the West Side Method is is so broad that like whatever it is that you describe to me for your workouts – I could say that's West Side. I could say that's, I could say ah. this is West Side. That's West Side. If you were like, no, no, I don't train that way. You know, I deadlift and I do this. And I'd be like, all right, well, that's a version of the max effort method. And I can kind of, and you could say, well, I don't really do different exercises mm -hmm. for my deadlift. I only sumo deadlift. But if you reference the fact that like you deadlift three weeks in a row and then you stop, I'm like, well, that's kind of what, so that's when you, side. <laughs> yeah, when you start to learn it, you start to kind of recognize what it also did for me. And this is really cool. And this is why I think people should read that article. It makes all of training easier to digest. It makes it understandable. It makes you go, Oh, that's why bodybuilding works. Oh, that's why periodization work. Oh, that's why, because it really just, a little bit like the nutrition story of the calories in, calories out thing. Um, the overarching theme of the whole entire thing when it comes to strength training is the amount of work that you get done. It's the volume, right? So Louie was just good at like figuring out how to get that volume in there the right way. And then the one thing that he probably touched upon that no one ever really messed with um, 
there there were people that have messed around with speed training and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, Doctor Squat, um, I don't know if he created the term, but he kind of uh, founded and got the information out there about something called compensatory acceleration, which is just you trying to move weight as fast as you can, regardless of the speed at which you move it. So, mm. you know, you go to squat 500 pounds, it might not move very fast because it's a heavy weight, but you're always trying to, once you have the form down, you're always trying to be as explosive as possible. So it wasn't so much just the speed work, but it was the practice. That's where people miss. And so that's why I would say like, it's impossible for it to not work. Yeah, I can understand how you might say like, Ah, the speed work, I don't really feel it's transferring over well. I, I kind of understand some of the argument on some of that. But what I would also say is like, well, you're kind of missing, misinterpreting what the speed work is for. When you do 10 sets of two on a box squat, you're getting uh, 20 opportunities to squat. And you're also getting 10 first opportunities to squat, which is how you get judged when you go into the competition. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is some sort of weird thing where you don't like the box squat or something, you could actually just do a regular squat. But how is it ever going to be a negative impact to do 10 sets of two with like 50 or 60% of your max where you're practicing over and over? You're like, oh, I wonder what shoes I should wear. Oh, I wonder what stance I should have. Oh, I wonder if I unrack the weight like this. You have 10 opportunities, 52 weeks out of the year, because that's kind of the way we did it. We did box squats, or we did 10 sets of two mm. every single week. So it's a forgotten element when it comes to powerlifting is the idea of practice. Weightlifters will practice, and you know martial arts are even called a practice. Mm -hmm. But powerlifting, no one ever considers it to be a practice, but it should be. Because you should be practicing how you do these lifts because you're trying to lift so much goddamn weight. Number one, I'm kind of pissed that I haven't heard of this article, Periodization Bible Part 1 and 2, until now. I'm like, I've known you. We've, have you heard? I haven't heard this before. I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to read that today. But number two, I never thought about the practice aspect of like the 10 sets of two thing. Mm -hmm. um, I always thought about the idea of like, okay, you know, you're just not, fit, you're, you're able to practice with every set. But the fact that you're able to really change it up multiple times every single week, you know, cause people are doing like four by eight or in like, let's say instead of 10 sets of two, they do four sets of five. Right. Um, it, it's like, it, it makes, it makes sense. That practice aspect is a really big deal. You can change up your foot stance. You could change up the way you unrack the bar. You can change your speed. Um, it allows room for adjustment for you to be able to find the optimal way to lift during that. And that's yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I lied. I have seen this. You have seen it? Mm -hmm. Well, you're better than me. <laughs> no, but, well, I haven't read it, but I, I have it. seen it. Yeah. Damn, Dave Tate looks mad Look different there. He's, He's fucking jacked jacked that hell. guy. Jesus Christ. Yeah, Dave Tate I is amazing. Shirt. He is a hilarious, like, <laughs> he, like, went and got his blood work done. This is a long, this that picture is from a long time ago. Yeah. He went and got his blood work done at, at one point, and his blood work was just horrific. Oh, God. And uh, he was like, I got to make some changes. So what he did instead of like, instead of like cooling it on like all the stuff that he was <laughs> taking, he went from like a power lifters version of, you know, the type of PEDs that he would utilize to a bodybuilding version of Isn't PEDs. Isn't that worse? Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. So in some weird way, he went on to like take more stuff, but he did cardio. Ah, he which, just switched it up. Yeah. yeah, which is amazing, it's right? Good for the heart. I mean, he did lose a lot of body fat, mm -hmm. which is great. But at the same time, it's like, I don't think that's what your doctor was kind of like. <laughs> that's not what he meant. Hoping <laughs> he would like switch to. That's incredible. Would uh, would Louie walk around the gym and tinker the way you do sometimes? Like, because I've seen you like grab like a hip circle and like a, a band and you'll like start moving shit around you. Be like, Andrew, come put your foot in here. And he's like, I don't know what I'm signing up for. But like, I mean, it seems like, I mean, he invented a bunch of shit. So like, would he, would you see him doing stuff like that? All the time. He'd always be messing with stuff. He'd always try to attach something to like the reverse hyper or like try to attach something to a bar. Um, there's a lot of shit that we tried that was like, a lot of things were really dangerous. <laughs> you know, he, and he would always say like the most dangerous exercises are the best. And I was like, yeah, maybe to a certain degree, but like, you know, how, dang <laughs> how dangerous does this shit have to get, you know? Because uh, like, you know, we would do like suspended good mornings, you know, where the weight is suspended in chains. 
and you would go all the way to the point where your uh, your shoulders were like lower than your hips. Like that would be your starting mm-hmm. position. Damn. And you're just like in this weird rounded over, you know, fucked in the ass position. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally, and, like you're and, in. <laughs> yeah, it was it was brutal. And we would do it sometimes with like the safety squat bar, you know, and just the safety squat bars already already pitching you forward. So a lot of stuff you would just get uh, completely killed by. Yeah, you've done this with like some stupid weight, haven't you? Yeah, I yeah. used yeah I used to do it with maybe I don't know six plates or so, and Jeez. sometimes I'd have even some chains on there. Um, it's an amazing exercise. I mean, it it's you know Louis he he always sounded like a crazy person, but like really it made a lot of sense. Like if you think about, you know, people say, hey, keep the bar close to you during a deadlift. Well, what's that for? Well, you keep the bar close to you on a deadlift because you're trying to lift the most optimal way and that's the safest way. And the safest, most optimal way is kind of nice because you're probably going to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. But what happens if you deadlift with the weight way out in front of you? Well, if someone would say, well, you could probably get injured, but what if you strengthened yourself that way? So we did stuff where we would deadlift. Louis would set up like some dumbbells and he'd be like in the way and you'd have to like keep the weight. Now you got to do it with a lot less weight. You're obviously not going to use the same weight and to prevent us from even using too much weight, which we would do anyway, uh, he would use like a fat bar or something. He'd be like, hey, use this fat bar because you're going to, you guys are going to kill yourselves doing this and we'd still fuck ourselves up. But like (laughs) you would have to, the, the dumbbells would be like in the way and you'd have to lift like deadlift the weight over them. So there's a lot of ideas and concepts and things that, oh yeah, there's with uh, 600 six and some chains. And it ends up being like a, this is referred to as like an Anderson squat uh, invented by the great uh, American Olympic lifter, Paul Anderson, who supposedly, again, these stories are fun. Uh, Paul Anderson would do these like rack movements um, where he'd lift the weight out of the rack. And supposedly his... Uh, setup was outside and he would like lift on like dirt and so every week he would like shovel out like more dirt so that he would be like lower or higher or put more dirt there so it'd be more range of motion or less range of motion who the hell knows like these are like i don't know if they're like fables or whatever but Mm -hmm. they're fun stories not bad posted in 2011 and it's basically a youtube short so you were way ahead of the game Mm -hmm. yeah yeah oh yeah filming uh yeah vertical yeah it's really cool how like West Side, because remember when Jesse Berta came on to podcast, uh, it was a while ago when you you guys were both uh, explaining mm-hmm. what West Side is. West Side seems to be like, when people look at it, they're like, there's too many variables, there's too many things. Mm-hmm. But it really seems to be a, a type of program that unconsciously, if someone isn't like, if someone is just doing it, they're plugging in a lot of holes and weaknesses, working on a lot of different things that could allow them to gain strength in different areas, mm-hmm. working both a, a wide stance and a close stance, deadlift, wide stance, squat, close, like all of these different things. Close grip, wide grip bench, yeah. Exactly. And it seems, it's just like, there's a, it, it there's a lot of training principles in different types of programs that really borrow a lot of stuff from those methods Mm -hmm. and i just find it wild as i like look at what a lot of other coaches do like even phil deru um he talks about it like he in in his uh in his um program thing like where you can go online and and learn about what he does he tells people buy the west side book of methods Mm -hmm. read this there's a like because there's so many things in it right that so many strength coaches need to like need to understand and use it's like everybody to an extent was probably influenced by louis Oh, yeah, all the people that we've had on the show. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, Ben Patrick, Phil DeRue, um, uh, many of the different strength coaches that I know that coached in the NFL for a long time, uh, Coach House, uh, Mark Uyama, uh, obviously like myself and Jesse Burdick were heavily impacted. Then you have uh, Chris Duffin and Matt Winning. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Chuck uh, Vogelpool. Chuck Vogelpool. Um, I mean, it's just like a huge list. You know, Matt Winning was a big part of uh, that West Side crew, like when they were kind of at their strongest, Jail Holdsworth. Uh, it was just, and now like a lot of these people, they have their own gyms, like mm-hmm. Jail's impacting a lot of people. Matt Winning has impacted a lot of people. Chris Duffin has impacted a lot of people. Um, you know, and like... I, the, the, all this stuff, like it unlocked stuff for me because I didn't think I was a person that was very capable of learning. And when we went and talked with Dave Tate, I was telling him how he was responsible for me kind of because Dave Tate was 
teaching the material from Louis Simmons um, in a more digestible way. Because Louis, uh, you know, Louis thinks everyone's like a couple chapters in on the West Side Method. So like where he starts to explain it, you're like, oh, I, you know, kind of, I missed, you know, I missed the previous episodes. I'm not up to speed. So you needed someone like Dave Tate who, uh, you know, had some issues learning himself to kind of explain a lot of that stuff. And when they started, when he started explaining to me, uh, I remember like really specifically just being like, holy shit, like I'm learning a lot. And then people would ask me questions and I started to have answers. And I'm like, this is really interesting. I, I kind of had this uh, self-doubt. I had this belief that I just had a really hard time learning and that it was like somehow exponentially more difficult for me than it was for everybody else, which wasn't necessarily true. I just had an issue learning certain things. Um, but I didn't know that like if shit, if I just found what I'm interested in, uh, I can learn about it all day. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I didn't know a lot of that stuff until uh, I started finding some of the stuff from the West side, West side methods. Were you guys able to talk much in recent memory? Like, I mean, I don't know, but like, I mean, you know, he's on power magazine, mm -hmm. but did you guys keep contact at all? I haven't spoke to Louie in a few years. Um, so I, so Louis Simmons, you know, he ended up on the cover of, of Power Magazine years ago. Um, he and I uh, haven't really talked since, well, the movie came out in like 2015 or something like that. I think that might've been the last time uh, I had some communication with him. I was fired by Louis Simmons. I used to do uh, CrossFit powerlifting certification seminars for him. And uh, Jesse and I just, we we were trying to peel it back a lot and he just wouldn't let us. When you and, say peel it back, what do you mean? Well, uh, so I started recognizing that the, first of all, the CrossFitters, they didn't even really care about like learning these methods. They were kind of just there just to get another cert mm. uh, because- mm. You know, it, it it helped their gym for them to have as many of these CrossFit certification courses as they could. So they got like, you know, more letters or more confirmation that they're great coaches or something. Um, anyway, uh, we kind of recognized that they didn't really care about uh, just some of the X's and O's that Louie wanted us to teach about yeah. Um, all this, all these reasons on why to do the dynamic effort stuff, we would, we would just, instead, we would just show them mm -hmm. and we would talk to them about how they can implement it into their training. Uh, but Louie wanted us to like very strictly like teach a very specific way. And that's why I don't work for anybody. I just, it's hard for me mm -hmm. to conform to anybody else's rules. And so we had some differencing of opinion there. And so he let me go. But um, I've always had nothing but love in my heart for the guy. Like I've always been, uh, a huge fan of his like in the movie like as you'll see i don't know if you got to this part yet but like i talk about louis simmons in the movie and it kind of paints me a little bit as like a heel but it wasn't really anything uh bad it was more like uh louis has one of the greatest methods of all time uh he loves powerlifting powerlifting has changed they power lifters went from utilizing, you know, uh, squat suits and, and uh, bench shirts and stuff like that into lifting raw. And my uh, criticism was like, where is Louie now? Like, how come his guys aren't competing against, uh, how come these guys aren't competing raw against some of these other people? Because Louie really loved boxing. And then as boxing transitioned out, and it got phased out by MMA. Mm -hmm. I was like, so boxers used to wear these like big gloves and now there's a new sport and these guys don't really have gloves. Uh, and I was like, Lou likes that, but like, why, why won't his own guys? And I just think that like he was kind of set in what he was doing and he was very comfortable in what he was doing. And guys were squatting 1100, 1200 pounds oh, yeah. and just breaking all kinds of crazy records that he felt confident in in that but i just think he still you know as much as he did for powerlifting as much as he did for west side i still think there could have even been another level because he had a lot of individuals in his gym benching 600 pounds raw deadlifting 800 pounds raw but he didn't want those guys going out and competing that way for who knows why mm. 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 do you think that he started messing with a lot of the chains and bands and stuff because 
uh, I'm not going to say powerlifting is boring, but I would say to like the general public that will go to like a 24 hour fitness and see all the machines and be like, oh, this is a good gym because there's so much variety here. Mm. But powerlifting is squat, bench, and right. deadlift. But you have mentioned this several times too, like, oh, go get a PR on mm. whatever the, the workout is, but like a PR with chains, a PR with a closed grip, PR you know, with a wide grip, etc. Do you think that was part of the reason why you started tinkering around with messing with some of the lifts? It's definitely a big reason why it makes some of that stuff fun is that you have opportunity to uh, get a PR every time you step into the gym because you might be doing something that you haven't really messed with before or it's been a long time since you've done it. Um, so I think that's a big reason. But the bands and the chain specifically, just like anything else that he adopted, uh, it was just, will this work? You mm -hmm. know, Is this going to make you better? And he found with his athletes that it made them better. It, it helped them a ton. And especially with a lot of the athletes that came in that weren't power lifters, um, you know, they saw profound results uh, when he had like MMA people come in. He had Olympic level sprinters come in. And it wasn't like, hey, look, you know, don't ever train with a barbell regular again. You're mm -hmm. only going to use bands and chains. It's just an addition to. And it's just, uh, it's like an add-on. And it's something that you can, you can kind of put uh, wherever you would want to. But Louis was willing to collaborate with everybody. Um, and, and anybody who's anybody went through that gym. Um, while I was there, uh, I saw Charles Poliquin. I saw Pavel. Um, I saw like just every, every strength guru, every, they've all been there, you know? And what Louis will say when you ask him about certain people, um, I was pretty obsessed with Poliquin and some of his methods and stuff. Uh, so I remember asking Louie because Louie was like, oh, he's going to come back out again. And and I was like, oh, he's been here before. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, well, how is he? And he's like, he sat right over there. And I was like, well, I'm like, well, uh, I was like, what do you think of him? You know, and he's like, he he's, and we're in the gym. He's like, he sat right over there, Smelly. And he didn't say anything else. And I just thought like, holy shit, that just means he didn't do anything. And he was in the gym. Like that tells you fucking everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so even stuff like that, I've learned from him. Like when I have people come in here and I show people around, uh, even employees that I've hired and stuff, I'll show people stuff. And if I show someone something and they don't really even like do anything with it, mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't, I don't, this is probably not going to work out. You know, like they're probably not for us. They're probably not going to fit in. Like if I show someone a tank and I say, hey man, why don't you give it a try? If they're like, nah, I'm good. Then I just, you know, I, I'm not, tr I'm not trying to have them do a sprint with it out of nowhere. You didn't pass the test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you failed. Um, so just little things like that, you know, that I, that I kind of picked up from him over the years. Um, another thing I picked up from him, which was really cool is that I was at his house and uh, we were going to go uh, to... Uh, the Cleveland Browns um, for the day. And he was like, the Cleveland Browns bought a bunch of reverse hypers. They bought a bunch of mm. equipment for him. By the way, people don't know this about Louis Simmons, but this is important. Louis Simmons is a fucking savage and he's a gangsta. He, he is fucking loaded. He is an entrepreneur to the fucking max. He's got dough. He's got money. I was going to ask you he about He has that. a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> He's very, very, very well established. He's very well off. And I I know that like the West Side versus the world probably didn't want to like talk too much about that. But I think it's a cool thing to highlight because here's a motherfucker that just leaned all the way in with everything he had into the one thing that he really, truly loved. Mm -hmm. Like all he, all he loved was lifting. He just loved fucking powerlifting. And I think that people don't understand like dude that guy's the reverse hypers in like every gym yeah and he's done big deals with rogue fitness and all these other companies but before those companies were around before before the times that we're in now where you can just you know scroll the internet and make something that's what i did to make the slingshot i searched knee wrap manufacturers i found a manufacturer and i made the fucking slingshot it was really easy but before that, <laughs> you know, you had to be a beast to like get shit made. Yeah. He's figuring out the reverse hyper glute ham raises, these uh, cages and stuff for squat racks. And they're all very particular in, in a way that was set up specifically to be able to use bands and utilize a lot of the other methods. Um, 
but like he would drive me around and he we would stop at like one place and he's like oh this guy uh this guy has carpet and we need to pick up these carpets because i think if we bench off these carpets you'll be able to you know, uh, sink the weight into the carpet and then press the weight up really fast. I think it will help absorb, uh, which we have like the man pond in the mm -hmm. gym. I don't know if you guys know what that <laughs> thing, that blue board thing or whatever. Yeah. So, and then he would go, and then he would stop at a, uh, at a place that, um, like a machine shop. And he's like, oh, these guys, they make my, they make my squat racks and they make this, they make that. And so he had to like really physically be very <clears throat> involved with a lot of that stuff, uh, early on. And one spot that we went to, I'll get back to the Cleveland Brown story in a second, but one one spot that we went to uh, was like a mattress place. And I was like, what? I was like, what's going on here? Like, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, he's like, they got this foam. And he's like, I think if you squat onto foam and then like, he goes, you know how like it's kind of hard, like if you're trying to get up off like a really soft couch, <laughs> it's harder to get up than it is like if you're on like a harder couch. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> and uh, he's like, I think if we get these really soft pads and you sink into them when you squat, oh, God. that you'll kind of like be stuck, you know, a little bit and you'll have to just have that much stronger like hip flexors and stuff like that. So he started getting like this foam. Then he had these ideas to like lift off the foam, but like some things, some things worked and some things didn't work so great. But he's like, this place also has springs. He's like, and I'm going to put springs in a bar and you're going to be able to like push it inward. You'll have a spring that you could push inward and flex your pecs harder, or you have a spring for outward because when you bench press, you're supposed to pull the bar apart. He's like, it will work your triceps like crazy. And so he had. Now there's there's a company I think that makes a similar bar oh, wow. uh, nowadays. But it was like that. So that bar that he had it was. It worked well, but it was also like kind of weird because like when you pushed inward, mm -hmm. then you lose a lot of balance because your hands are close mm -hmm. together. And if they went like different, then you'd like go all over the place. You'd be on too much on one side. But it worked amazing, especially for like pushing the weight out. But anyway, back to my Cleveland Browns story. So mm. uh, we were supposed to go to the Cleveland Browns. He had this huge uh, account with them. They bought a ton of reverse hypers and a ton of products. And we're just about to leave. And he gets a phone call and he gets on the phone and uh, he's going over these percentages. He's going over like, you know, one week we do good mornings, the next week we deadlift, the next week we squat. And he's going on and on and on. Talks to this guy for like an hour. And I'm like, oh man, we're really going to be like really late, you know, in comparison to like when we were supposed to leave. Um, now we're leaving like an hour later. And I said, I said, oh, I said, uh, he got off the phone. I said, who is that, Lou? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> it was just some guy from Akron, Ohio. He wanted to learn how to, he wanted to get stronger. He's like, all right, let's go. And then we got in his truck and we fucking went. And I was just like, fuck man, like that's so cool. Like he, he spent all this time. That guy didn't, that guy wasn't like trying to put an order in to buy a t-shirt or yeah. anything. He wasn't trying to sell him anything. He wasn't, I just thought like, man, that's like just so legit. Like all the fucking guy cares about is like, and, and even with the money and the success that he had, he could have been exponentially that much more successful mm. because he would have just had blinders on and like just trying to figure out ways to get as strong as possible. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, when you were talking about how he like drove you around to those different places and how much of a business savage he was, especially for the time that he was making all these things, you think that, uh, kind of, you think I made it easier for you to create the slingshot when you did? I'm just, because like, I mean, I'd imagine that's a really good experience to have as a young person going around with somebody like that and mm -hmm. seeing how they conduct business. It's like that must have changed some shit. And also, do you think he did it on purpose? Yeah, probably. You know, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think that it, it had a huge impact. I mean, I wouldn't have made the slingshot. Like there wouldn't be a super training. There just wouldn't be. Um, I knew that when I... So I lived in Ohio f for like about a year. I went to Westside Barbell. Uh, my wife and I decided like we had my son, Jake. We wanted to move back to where she was from. <clears throat> so we moved to Davis, California. But when I moved to California, I was like, I have to figure out a way to have a gym. And I need to have lifters to lift with. And just for my own selfish reasons, because I... I need to get as strong as I possibly can. Like this is now like a passion for me as well. I want to like dump everything I have into this because um, wrestling didn't work out. I always knew that powerlifting was kind of like always there. I did it when I was young. I did it pretty well. So I was like, 
let me just see what happens if I go all go all in. And then so it was a matter of like trying to build up a team and build up a squad and um and we did. And we were able to like, you know, we were able to get uh a decent amount of members, a decent amount of uh guys that had good strength and I was able to build up people stronger than myself, which was really helpful. I don't have I didn't have the highest squat, didn't have the highest bench, didn't have the highest deadlift in the gym. And so it was it was a a good a good way for me to get stronger. And I learned a lot of that from watching Louie and what he put together. Um but yeah, he had a crazy influence on me um in terms of like I guess just recognizing that you can like live your life whatever way you want. Mm -hmm. and, and that you should. You should figure out a way to live your life whatever way you want. And it had the same impact on Dave Tate and the same impact on hundreds, if not thousands of other people like Matt Wenning and like J.L. Holdsworth and like Jesse Burdick. Not each individual person may not make crazy amounts of money, but everything they do every day is all within the things that they fucking love to do. They love to do it. You know, so maybe they haven't figured out the right algorithm just yet with their business, <clears throat> and maybe some of them have, but they are, they are doing the shit that they love to do uh, on a daily basis. And so, yeah, no, that was huge uh, to kind of see that firsthand from Louis and to see the way he interacted <clears throat> with everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he also had a lot, he also had tons of fun. Mm -hmm. He would laugh all the time and like, he would talk shit. Like I told you guys, <laughs> he would, he just had these stupid jokes all the time and he would laugh at them himself. Like he, he, he loved, he loved his own jokes. Um, he had one that he used all the time. Uh, and he would like, we would go to Bob Evans, which is just like a Denny's basically on the East coast. And by the way, he paid for every meal mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, cause he's just, he was ex extremely generous. Um, especially how you guys eat like that shit, yeah, that's a bill. It's going to add up. It's a fucking bill. <laughs> Yeah, well, he, so, like, with me, it's, like, I would at least try to pay here and there, and, like, so every once in a while, I would be able to, like, pay, like, without him knowing it or something like that, uh -huh. but then he would kind of, like, he'd lean over to me and be like, oh, great, so-and-so's here. He's like, "It the, the bill's going to be a lot today, you know? He really, I think uh, he, like, loved, I think he, like, loved paying for it, like, secretly, you know? Yeah. He's like, oh, he's only here for a free meal. He's like, uh -huh. what a, he's like, what a bum. <laughs> I'm like, I think I'm a bum, I'm a, you know, <laughs> but, uh, he would say to, uh, like female waitresses just cause he just always try to like, I don't know, he, he would flirt, but in a very, like, he's an older guy, like in a very, uh, clean way. Yes. But he would say, uh, Hey, didn't we go to different schools together? And the girls would <laughs> laugh and they'd be like, Oh my God, I think we did. <laughs> and he's like, did they not hear what I said? He would laugh so hard. And he's and, and and then it would come back and then it would be like they're like oh I I realize what you said because <laughs> there's no way we couldn't have went to school together he goes yeah I said didn't we go to different schools together anyway he would just like start rambling and start having a conversation with them because he just I don't know he was just like outgoing that way yeah you mentioned it on a on a podcast previous like fairly recently was in uh, when we were in Ohio but you said you would mess with like some of like the uh, like the silverware on the table oh, and yeah. stuff and he'd freak out. Yeah, he had like frozen shoulder or something. Like something happened to his shoulder. And uh, so like, you know, like when you go to Denny's and places like that, they have all this crap on the table uh, trying to show you like the specials that they have. Drink menu. Yeah, whatever. these all this stuff, right? And uh, so every day I would just, I'd get there before him a lot of times and I would just like shift it towards his <laughs> side. I don't know if he's like it's obsessive compulsive, but like <laughs> I, I do know, I do know that like <laughs> whenever we would eat together, he would have stuff like strategically like in these certain places. And uh, I would, so I would just move stuff around a little bit. And every once in a while, he'd be like, God damn it. He's like, this shit's always in my way. <laughs> and uh, in the gym too, like he would set stuff up and it sometimes takes forever, you know, with certain setups that we do in the gym. Mm, yeah. Uh, he would set up the bands and stuff and he would be all excited and he would have like 185 pounds on a deadlift bar. And then he'd have the bands all set up just the way he wanted and he'd be like, now this is totally set up for tomorrow. Can't wait to deadlift tomorrow. He's like, let's get out of here, Smelly. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, he, he would like take off and then I would, I would spend, you know, a few minutes like clearing the weight off, putting the bands <laughs> away, putting the barbell away. And then he'd come in the next morning. He's like, God damn it. He's like, this happens every week. <laughs> I'm not surprised he sent you up as a heel in that documentary. You're fucking, you're fucking up silverware laughing to yourself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. That's great, though. It was, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck, man. And then he's like, he's like, who, who was here last? You know, he's always like trying to figure it out. It's like. I don't, I, don't like, I don't know, man. We closed it up, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. It's like 60 people have a key. I don't know, man. Anybody could have done it. Oh, God. Yeah, how do people have a key to this gym? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Mm. Mm. Uh, you took a lot from that guy, man. That's great. Mm-hmm. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, free gym, inventions, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, he was an unbelievable person, and uh, he is someone that helped uh, shape my life. And so, like, again, just to kind of reiterate, like when I think about death, I, you know, okay, there's people that are left behind that, that do love him. There's people that he probably left behind that still rely on him to this day. Um, but like none of my memories change, you know, none of my times with him change. Like we, it's not like, uh, just cause he died that, uh, the laughs go away. It's, you know, it's not really, if anything, like everything just gets amplified. That's really what happens. Mm -hmm. Everything that he did gets amplified and you're like, whoa, the impact is like, uh, you know, too large to even almost like figure out. He impacted so many, uh, so many great people in so many different ways. And then there's also stuff too, where you can look at someone like that, who's an icon and, uh, and you can also like kind of think okay like where like we mentioned the white belt mentality well louis wasn't really big on like stretching he wasn't really big on like nutrition but those were things that he didn't know a ton about i mean he would talk to his athletes sometimes talk to some of the guys and say hey you know i think you need to do a better job with your nutrition he was always very big on a lot of the guys uh improving their body composition he just didn't necessarily know um, not that he didn't know how to do it cause he, he's been around, he was around forever and he did know about like bodybuilding and powerlifting and stuff. He just didn't, he didn't employ that same discipline. Um, and he, and so he wasn't like, uh, trying to impose that or enforce that on people. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes when some people like this, when you start to think about them, uh, not only think about how amazing they were, you can also think about, oh, well, I wonder Fuck, man, I wonder, right? Because we just saw, we just had an individual on our podcast that deadlifted 1,025 yeah. raw, you know, just in a singlet uh, and a belt. And, you know, Louis guys, like we, we all wore, you know, multi multiple layers of powerlifting equipment that helped assist uh, the lift. So like what heights could he have taken it to uh, if he had some, if he was open-minded towards some of these other things. Maybe he just didn't have the time for it because maybe he was so preoccupied with just this one uh, dimension of strength. Mm -hmm. This one, and I, you know, I'm guilty. I, I got obsessed with that one dimension of strength. Um, I think all of us kind of have. And then we were like, oh wait, a figure skater is actually really strong. Someone who's high level skateboarder is actually really strong. Someone who's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt is really fucking strong. It's just like maybe they come in the gym and they have a hard time benching 185. They're not strong on a bench press. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where that conversation ends. But maybe they're good at pull ups. You know, there's so many different variations of strength. But yeah, Louis is one of a kind. And the uh, max effort work, the dynamic effort work, the GPP type stuff, that's the dragging of the sled. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, I mentioned like kind of like the box squats earlier and then just so many inventions and creations. And then again, you have a lot of other lifters that spawned off of him. He's kind of like, almost like Bill Walsh, the great uh, football coach, uh, or coach K or some of these just all time great coaches. Mm -hmm. They didn't just have an impact on their, some of their players. They had impact on other coaches that impact on people from all around the world. So um, for those that are left behind uh, at Westside and um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen or, or come of Westside Barbell, uh, 
but Louis has kind of stated, I think he says it in the movie, um, West Side versus the World, that the gym dies with him. So I, you know, I, for those people that are kind of left behind, I, I my heart goes out to you and I, uh, uh, respectfully, uh, you know, just want to say that I love Louis Simmons, always have, always will. He was a major impact on my life and just nothing but, nothing but positive vibes coming from over here at Super Training Gym. Oh, so I think that about wraps it up. <clears throat> I think so. All righty. Well, thank you everybody for checking out today's episode. Uh, I guess, yeah, do us a, a huge favor or, you know, just drop us a comment down below, maybe a, a last farewell for uh, Louis Simmons down in the comments below. And uh, make sure you guys like this episode and subscribe if you guys are not subscribed already. And uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and Sima. Where are you at? At Nsima Inyang on Instagram and YouTube, Nsima Inyang on TikTok and Twitter, and Westside vs. the World on this mm. app called Pluto. You guys don't actually have to mm. subscribe to it. You can get it for free. All the ads go through all the fucking annoying ads. Mm. But can I just you get your login it. info? I don't pay for it. I'm, no, watching but I'm just free. saying I don't. I don't want to have to register. But yeah, you guys can check <laughs> it out on Pluto. Kidding. It's really, it's really good. We should we'll podcast check it out. with the director. That would be cool. That would be really yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was well done. The voice, the guy that's doing the voiceover in that mm. sounds like this famous yeah, black yeah. It, dude. Is it him? It's a famous voiceover guy. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's this. Yeah, I I don't know his Sick. name, but that voice I've mm -hmm. heard in so many yeah. things. So, yeah, they did a great job. Yeah, Louis has a favorite uh, movie. Let me see if I can get this right. Um, he, so he has a favorite movie that, uh, that he would talk about quite a bit. He loved uh, like. Love like ninja, like assassin movies, and like, um, yeah, just movies that were kind of different. He he'd love, he loved blood, you know. He loved like the Bruce Lee Chuck Norris shit. Yes, like over uh, the top. Yeah, this okay. movie was called Shogun Assassins, and um, I might butcher this, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Um, there's a scene in the movie where. Uh, a dad explains to his son, his son's like two years old. Mm -hmm. uh, the mother, uh, the mother has this horrific dream and she says, Oh my God, this, this, uh, horrible dream is coming true. And she just like starts spitting blood and she dies. And the dad goes to the son, this little boy. And he said, uh, you must choose a path. My son, you must choose either to play with the ball or to take the sword and join me as a warrior. And the boy kind of goes towards the ball just a little bit. And then he crawls over towards the sword and grabs the sword. So Louis always loved that story. He shared that with everybody. And he said, uh, I feel like everyone that has joined West Side Barbell has joined me in a journey to hell. <laughs> That's true. Pretty wild. That yeah. um that scene is the intro of a dope ass Wu Tang Clan song. Oh, is it really? Yeah, so I know it well. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's legit as fuck. Holy shit. Mm-hmm. That's dope. Did we sign off already? You gotta do you. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength's never weakness, weakness never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.